man McClellan was complaining to would also later report that he and two witnesses had heard McClellan say, quote, I'll get the captain before we get to Norfolk. I will. Welcome. Come gather around the campfire and let me tell you a story. Today, we're going to be talking about the ghost ships, Mary Celeste and Carol A. Deering. There's something about life at sea that makes folks a little superstitious. Maybe it's the precarity of being at the mercy of the wind and the waves and the storms and the currents. Maybe it's just the type of person that an ocean life attracts. Maybe it's the fact that sailing is one of the world's oldest professions. Whatever the reason, sailors are known to have a certain fondness for myth and legend. One of the most popular type of sea stories is that of the ghost ship, or phantom ship, depending on who you ask. There are some ships that may not be real at all, ones that have no evidence of ever existing, spotted simply as glowing apparitions cresting over the waves. Some ghost ships are certainly real. They've been found drifting and fully searched, only to find no crew or passengers. One ghost ship even made it into the White House, in the form of the wood made to make the President's desk in the Oval Office. Whether the crews were washed overboard, escaped in lifeboats, were killed by enemies, attacked each other in mutinies, or fell victim to a pirate's curse or supernatural force, today we're going to be discussing some of the most mysterious cases. One of the most well-known mythological ghost ships is the Flying Dutchman, seen across popular culture in everything from Spongebob to Scooby-Doo to Pirates of the Caribbean. The Flying Dutchman is a mysterious ship with a ghostly glow that sailors have reported spotting for hundreds of years. Seeing it can be considered an omen of doom. Although, if all the sailors that saw the Dutchman went to their watery graves, we never would have heard about it. The most common version of the Dutchman's backstory states that the ship is captained by a crew who are doomed to never make port, to never reach land, doomed to wander the seas for eternity. The first printed stories of the Dutchman originated in 1790 and 1795, telling the tale of a Dutch man-o'-war ship that was trying to get around the Cape of Good Hope during a huge storm. Although the crew begged the captain to turn back, he vowed that he would keep sailing around the Horn if it took him until the end of time. Well, according to this story, he should have chosen his words more carefully, because the devil heard him and cursed him to sail forever. His only hope to break the curse would be to find a woman who loved him so much that she would swear her life to the captain. Every seven years, the devil would allow him to come ashore to look for her. In 1803, a written account first brought up the idea of the crew being cursed for some terrible crime, writing, quote, The crew of this vessel are supposed to have been guilty of some dreadful crime in the infancy of navigation and to have been stricken with pestilence and are ordained still to traverse the ocean on which they perished till the period of their penance expires. Some legends actually point to a real man as the captain of the ship, East India Company captain Bernard Folk, whose voyages were so fast that there were grumbles among other sailors that he had made a deal with the devil. Sightings of the ship continued being reported throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. King George V and his brother Prince Albert Victor reported seeing the ship off the shore of Australia, writing, quote, At 4 a.m. the Flying Dutchman crossed our bows. A strange red light as of a phantom ship all aglow, in the midst of which light the masts, spars, and sails of a brig two hundred yards distant, stood out in strong relief as she came up on the port bow, where also the officer of the watch from the bridge clearly saw her, as did the quarter-deck midshipman, who was sent forward at once to the forecastle, but on arriving there there was no vestige, 
nor any sign whatever of any material ship was to be seen either near or right away to the horizon the night being clear and the sea calm thirteen persons altogether saw her at ten forty five a m the ordinary seamen who had this morning reported the flying dutchman fell from the foretop mast cross trees on to the top gallant forecastle and was smashed to atoms unquote. the scientific explanation of the dutchman is often the idea of the phantom organa mirage this occurs when rays of light passing through different temperatures can make an image appear on the horizon it's often seen at sea in the arctic and in deserts it can make the image of a ship appear but it will also show the same ship upside down on top of the right side up ship the name comes from the idea that these phantom ships are illusions created by the sorceress morgan le fay who you may know from the magic treehouse book series or the legends of king arthur a similar case to the dutchman is the fire ship of bay de chaleur or the chaleur phantom this type of ghost light is seen near new brunswick canada some believe the flash of light comes from natural gas coming from beneath the sea or from marsh gas drifting over the water as one geologist hypothesized people who have seen it believe that it takes the form of a tall three-mast sailing ship on fire there are several legends of what caused the ghost ship to first appear one story tells of a woman who was killed by pirates and cursed them with the phrase for as long as the world is may you burn on the bay another legend is that the burning ship was catholic revenge for a sailor who had been murdered by his crewmates another tells of a portuguese sea captain who arrived at heron island and began to kidnap and enslave the native Mi'kmaq people the Mi'kmaq then tortured the captain and his brother in an act of revenge as their ship burned the men jumped into the sea and promised to haunt the bay for one thousand years one woman a mrs pettigrew reported in eighteen seventy eight that she was standing on her porch when a sailor came to her asking for treatment for burns when she turned back to him he appeared with no legs there were also rumors of the bodies of both portuguese sailors and Mi'kmaq natives washing up on shore st elmo's fire is another well-documented ocean light phenomenon where sharp metal objects can expel electrical discharge when there's a strong electrical field in the air like that created by a lightning storm unlike the light of the chaleur phantom this glowing light created on the mass of ships was often regarded as a good omen by sailors because it showed that saint elmo the patron saint of sailors was with them the hissing fizzing blue violet light can also appear on airplanes chimneys church spires and even on the horns of bulls it's been observed by julius caesar charles darwin nikola tesla benjamin franklin ferdinand magellan and shows up in moby dick and the adventures of rin tin tin the mary celeste is one of the most famous ghost ships of history and unlike the flying dutchman it's well recorded to actually have existed the ship was originally built in nova scotia to carry cargo under the name amazon in 1861 she had a bit of a troubled history on her maiden voyage her captain became severely ill and then died when they returned to port she also ran into fishing equipment off the coast of maine and later collided with a smaller english ship and sank it in 1867 the ship ran ashore during a storm and was abandoned by the crew as a wreck but she was picked up by a canadian businessman and sold to an american sailor named richard w haynes from new york who paid one thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars for it and spent eight thousand eight hundred and twenty five dollars restoring it haynes re-registered the ship under the name mary celeste in eighteen sixty eight so they fixed the ship pretty fast considering it took my college two years to fix a hole outside my apartment building she may have been named for the illegitimate daughter of the astronomer galileo but unfortunately haynes may have gone a touch over budget as the ship was seized by his creditors just a year later she underwent several more years of refurbishment 
and was given a new captain, who would be her last, Captain Benjamin Briggs. Briggs was born in Wareham, Massachusetts, on April 24, 1835. He was one of five sons of another sea captain, Nathan Briggs, and four out of five of the kids eventually became sailors, with Benjamin and one of his brothers also becoming captains. I don't know what the fifth kid was doing, but he must have felt left out of all the sea talk. In 1862, when he was 27, he married a cousin, it was a different time, named Sarah Elizabeth Cobb, and they had two children. Their son Arthur was born in 1865, and their daughter Sophia was born in 1870. Briggs had been considering retiring with his brother Oliver, but instead they both invested into two more ships. Oliver's ship was the Julia A. Halleck, and Benjamin's was the Mary Celeste. And yeah, if you haven't guessed it already, Briggs probably should have just retired. In October of 1872, Benjamin Briggs decided to take the Mary Celeste on her first trip after refurbishment, and the destination was Genoa, Italy. His wife Sarah and baby Sophia came with him, while Arthur was left with his grandmother to continue school. Briggs reportedly chose his crew very carefully, and they were later described as, quote, peaceable and first-class sailors, unquote. There was a first and second mate, a steward, and four general seamen. In October of, the Mary Celeste was loaded with 1,701 barrels, an oddly specific number, of alcohol, but the crew wouldn't be popping corks on this trip, as all of this alcohol was denatured which means it was mixed with chemicals to make it poisonous or otherwise unpleasant for drinking. This type of alcohol would later lead to blindness and death when people got desperate drinking it during Prohibition, but that's a different story. The Briggs couple wrote several letters to the captain's mother with their son in the days before they left while they were delayed by poor weather. Captain Briggs wrote, quote, Our vessel is in beautiful trim, and I hope we shall have a fine passage, unquote. Sarah wrote, quote, Tell Arthur I make great dependence on the letters I shall get from him, and will try to remember anything that happens on the voyage which he would be pleased to hear, unquote. Nearby in Hoboken, New Jersey, the Canadian ship De Gradia was also preparing to go to Genoa to deliver petroleum. The De Gradia captain, David Morehouse, and Benjamin Briggs likely knew each other, and one story even states that they had dinner together the night before the Mary Celeste left, although this probably didn't happen. They were traveling roughly the same route at the same time, although the Mary Celeste left earlier. Then came December 4th, 1872. Captain Morehouse came to the deck of the De Gradia when they were halfway between the Azor Islands and mainland Portugal. The helmsman ran to tell the captain that there was another ship, about six miles, or 9.7 kilometers away, moving erratically towards them. The crew grew concerned about its strange movements, and then even more so when the ship came closer, and there was no crew seen on deck. Two sailors from the De Gradia went over to the mystery ship to investigate, and soon discovered it was the Mary Celeste, by the name written on the back. No one was on the ship. The sails were partially missing, and the rigging was damaged. Loose rope was hanging over the side of the ship, and several hatches were open. The only lifeboat was gone. The glass cover on the ship's compass was broken, and the rest of the navigational equipment was missing. Charts had been thrown around. When the men dropped down into the hold of the ship, they found about three and a half feet, or a meter, of water, which was strange but not incredibly concerning for such a large ship. One of the two pumps in the hold had been disassembled, and on deck they found a makeshift sounding rod, which is used for measuring water levels in the hold. The ship's log was supposed to be filled in daily, but when the men found it in the mate's cabin, the last entry was from nine days earlier. It listed the Mary Celeste's position as being 400 nautical miles, or 740 kilometers, away from where the ship was found. The cabins had gotten wet, but there was no major damage or signs of chaos. 
Some scattered items were found in the Briggs's cabin, and his navigation instruments were missing, along with most of the ship's records. But the cargo was still there, although several barrels were empty, and the ship still had six months of food and water. The two sailors from the De Gradia returned to their own ship and reported back to Captain Morehouse. He decided to send half his crew of eight men to pilot the ship in 600 miles or 1,100 kilometers to Gibraltar, with the De Gratia following. They reached the coast on December 12th, and Morehouse wrote to his wife, quote, I can hardly tell what I am made of, but I do not care so as long as I got in safe. I shall be well paid for the Mary Celeste, unquote. The authorities immediately impounded the ship so salvage hearings could be conducted. This was a type of court proceeding to determine what had happened to the salvage ship and who would receive a reward. The Attorney General of Gibraltar was a man named Frederick Solly Flood, who was described by one historian as a man, quote, whose arrogance and pomposity were inversely proportional to his IQ, unquote. The two sailors who had investigated the Mary Celeste first gave testimony that convinced Flood that there had been foul play and that it involved the alcohol cargo. Flood ordered a thorough investigation of the ship. The investigators found cuts on the bow of the ship that they believed were caused by sharp instruments, and a deep cut, possibly from an axe, and stains on the railings that could be blood. There was also possible blood found in a sword in Captain Briggs' cabin. There was no damage on the hull that suggested the ship had hit anything. Flood believed that all of this evidence led to the theory of human responsibility. He sent his final report to London with the narrative that the four general crew members had gotten drunk on the alcohol, murdered the Briggs family and the first and second mate, cut the ship themselves to make it seem like it had hit something, and then fled in a lifeboat. He also believed that Captain Morehouse had changed the ship's log about where the Mary Celeste was last reported to be farther away, not believing that it was possible for it to travel so far with no crew. But one major issue with this theory is the fact that the alcohol was undrinkable, that was that the stains on the sword in the wood were later revealed to not be blood. A later report from the U.S. Navy decided that the marks on the ship were damaged from the ocean, not a mad, drunken crew. Also, if it had been a mutiny, why had the crew left their personal belongings and all of the food and water supplies? They would have likely left in the light boat, but what happened to them after that? So if it wasn't a drunken crew committing mutiny, what did happen to the Mary Celeste's crew? There's a few different theories. One theory that popped up in 1931 proposes that Captain Morehouse had laid in wait for the Mary Celeste and then invited the crew onto the De Gradia, where they killed them. But it would have been very difficult, if not impossible, for the De Gradia to get ahead of the Mary Celeste, as they left eight days later. Some people believed that Briggs and Morehouse conspired together to abandon the ship and get the salvage money. But the fact that they knew each other well before this incident is disputed, and it would be odd for Captain Briggs to abandon his son Arthur if he was starting a new life somewhere else. The fact that the disappearing crew was bound to draw international attention would also not make sense for a scam. Other people blame the great scourge of the sea. Pirates. There were pirates active near Morocco during this time, but if pirates had attacked the Mary Celeste, why would they leave behind all of the captain and crew's possessions, some of which were valuable, and most of the cargo? A 1925 historian, John Gilbert Lockhart, proposed that Captain Briggs killed everyone on the ship and himself in a religious mental break. But Lockhart later apologized to Briggs' descendants and withdrew this story. Several people have turned to scientific explanations for the mystery. It's possible there could have been a water spout, which is a huge spinning column of air over an ocean or large lakes and seas, that can suck up water and basically become a water tornado. That could explain the damage to the sails and the rigging and the water found in the hold, 
and it's possible that Briggs and the crew were confused by the strange phenomena and got an incorrect reading from the homemade measuring stick that was found on deck that led them to believe the ship was sinking. Another natural explanation was that the ship could have become becalmed, which means it stopped moving because the wind died down. The ship could have drifted towards a nearby reef, and the crew thought it may hit it, so they got into the lifeboat. If the wind then picked back up, the Mary Celeste could have been blown back out to sea, and the lifeboat sunk. But evidence against this theory is the fact that not all of the sails on the ship were open and being used, as they would be if they were trying to catch any wind that was available. One of the strongest theories is that of a sea quake and a potential explosion. If there had been a strong earthquake on the seabed, it could have damaged the alcohol cargo and released dangerous fumes. The fact that some of the hatches were open showed that it was possible the crew was trying to air out the cargo hold or inspecting it for damage. There had been previous cases of ships carrying alcohol exploding. Captain Briggs's cousin, Oliver Cobb, believed in this theory and thought that leaking alcohol could have caused rumbling sounds and noxious smells that would have concerned the crew. The trailing lines could show that the Captain Briggs had improperly tied up the lifeboat to the ship and they had drifted away. The missing lifeboat is certainly key to most theories. Some people have suggested that the crew may have boarded the lifeboat because something dangerous happened on board and they were waiting for it to be over. However, it would be strange that they would tie themselves to a sinking or otherwise dangerous boat. A historian wrote, quote, If the Mary Celeste had blown her timbers, she would still have been a better bet for survival than the ship's boat. If this is what happened, Briggs behaved like a fool. Worse, a frightened one. Unquote. This theory has also been criticized because there was no damage seen from an explosion. But in 2006, a chemistry professor from University College London named Andrea Sella conducted an experiment with Channel 5 News. He built a model of the Mary Celeste's hold and created an explosion with butane gas. There was a large blast and ball of flame, but no visible damage. Sella stated, What we created, quote, What we created was a pressure wave type of explosion, there was a spectacular wave of flame, but behind it was relatively cool air. No soot was left behind, and there was no bur burning or scorching. Unquote. In 2002, there was another modern reconstruction done by documentary filmmaker Anne McGregor. McGregor refuted the idea of sea monsters or large storms because there was not significant enough damage, and she also did not believe in the explosion theory because the hatch was mostly intact, and the De Gratius sailors did not report the smell of alcohol fumes. The nine empty barrels were made of red oak instead of white oak, which was more susceptible to the alcohol leaking out instead of turning to noxious gas. She also refuted the idea of a crazy crew member, like was shown in a movie about the Mary Celeste, as that legend was likely based on two German brothers in the crew, Volkert and Boy Lorenzen, whose personal belongings were not found on the ship like the others, but when she interviewed their descendants, she was told that their things had been washed away. McGregor also couldn't determine any motive that would have couldn't determine any motive that they would have for murdering their crewmates. An oceanographer from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute couldn't find any major damage that would have prevented the ship from sailing and descendants of Captain Briggs' surviving son told her that he was well-trusted and showed no signs of madness. She found that in her remade Mary Celeste, one of the key pieces of navigational equipment, the chronometer, was faulty and may have put them severely off course, much closer to where it had been found near the De Gradia. Captain Briggs may have tried to sail closer to the Azor Islands, McGregor and the oceanographer agreed that if the crew left the ship, they likely did it on the day the last log was written, nine days before it was found, where they would have been in sight of land. As for the disassembled pump, McGregor believes that the pump may have become clogged with coal dust from the ship's previous trip and debris from a recent refurbishment, 
leaving the crew unable to pump out water from the hold. Because it was full of cargo, the pump was broken, and the sounding rod that they were using to measure was homemade, the crew may have thought there was more water than there actually was. McGregor said she would be continuing her research. There's also been many fictional accounts of what happened to the Mary Celeste. The Los Angeles Times reported the story with fictionalized details in 1883, writing, quote, Every sail was set. The tiller was lashed fast. Not a rope was out of place. The fire was burning in the galley. The dinner was standing, untasted and scarcely cold. The log written up to the hour of her discovery, unquote. Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the famous Sherlock Holmes series, wrote a fabricated story of the Mary Celeste called J. Habakkuk Jeffson's Statement. The ship in this story was carrying passengers and was called the Marie Celeste and was sailing from Boston to Lisbon. Captain Briggs was renamed J.W. Tibbs. And in Conan Doyle's story, it's a survivor's account from an American passenger named Jeffson. Jeffson is a Union veteran who received a safety charm from an elderly African-American woman years earlier, which he takes with him on the sea voyage. There are two other passengers, including a mixed-raced man named Septimus Goring. A week into the journey, the captain's wife and baby go missing. The next day, the captain is found shot dead, and they believe he took his own life in his grief. When the ship lands, they've decided to continue on to Portugal. But before they can leave, a group of Africans row out to the ship and link up with Septimus Goring and the black crew members, who kill all the white crew and passengers except for Jeffson, because he has the magic charm. Goring tells Jeffson that he hates all white people and was enacting his revenge for slavery, but he releases Jeffson because of the talisman and sets him adrift where he is rescued. Conan Doyle meant for this racially problematic story to be taken as fiction, but some people did believe that it was at least partially true. The Strand magazine printed another fictional survivor account in 1913 from a man named Abel Fosdyke. He claimed that he was a last-minute addition to the crew and that while they were at sea, Captain Briggs, who he calls Griggs, had a raised platform built for his wife and daughter to have a better view of the surroundings. Then one day, Briggs and the first mate wanted to settle a casual debate about how well someone could swim with clothes on, and they both exchanged clothes and jumped into the sea. Briggs' wife and child and several of the crew members ran up to the platform to watch when the first mate was attacked by a shark. As he cried out, the rest of the crew ran up to the platform to see, and it collapsed, throwing everyone into the ocean to be attacked by the sharks. Fostak stated that he lived because he fell on top of debris and floated to Africa, but did not reveal the story until he was on his deathbed. Unlike Conan Doyle's story, this was presented to be taken as fact, but Fostak was not a recorded passenger, and there were several big errors in his account, like saying Briggs's daughter was seven instead of two, saying the crew was English instead of American and German, and that there were thirteen of them instead of seven, misnaming several people, and having a general ignorance of nautical language. There was also no evidence of the damage that Fosdyke described. There was also another false survivor account in the 1920s about a man named John Pemberton that involved a murder plot in collaboration with the De Gradia, but it also had major errors and no supporting evidence. In 1924, the Daily Express published another widely believed false story from the ship's alleged boatswain officer, who said the brig's crew found a different abandoned ship filled with gold and silver, and they stole the money, abandoned the Mary Celeste, and fled to Spain. And of course, there's always been paranormal suggestions. Could the crew have been abducted by aliens? But this theory started to go around when people were spreading the idea that the ship had been found in perfect condition with food still on the table, and the log filled out. The damage, the lack of log reports for several days, and the missing lifeboat meant that either the crew abandoned ship, or these aliens were pretty messy. In 1904, there was also a suggestion that the crew of the Mary Celeste had been plucked one by one off the ship by a giant squid. But although giant squids do exist, 
It's unlikely that it could have taken all of them, the lifeboat, and the navigation equipment. After the ship was released from Gibraltar, it sailed for 12 more years, but was eventually purposely run aground in Haiti in an attempted insurance fraud. In 2001, an author and adventurer named Clive Cusley claimed to find the wreck of the ship, but analysis found that that ship had gone under at least a decade after the Mary Celeste. The final resting place of the ship and its crew remains unknown. In 1921, hundreds of miles away, near the Bermuda Triangle, another ghost ship ran aground with no crew to be found. This one is known by some as the ghost ship of the Outer Banks. The G.G. Deering Company built this cargo ship in 1919 in Bath, Maine, and it was named for the owner's son, Carol A. Deering. It was 255 feet long, with five huge masts, and could carry 3,500 tons. It had several successful voyages that year, until July 19, 1920, when it began its final trip. The Deering set out from Puerto Rico to bring coal to Rio de Janeiro. The captain was supposed to be William H. Merritt, and his last name really fit the man, because he was a World War I hero who saved the entire crew of the Dorothy B. Barrett when it sank from a German submarine in 1918. This was also a family expedition, as his son Sewell was the first mate. There were ten other crew members who were all from Scandinavia, mostly Denmark. But when the ship left a stop in Newport News, Virginia, on August 26th, they were forced to turn around and drop off Captain Merritt, who had become ill. His son stayed in Virginia with him, and a previously retired 66-year-old captain, Willis B. Wormwell, was found as a replacement. Another man, Charles B. McLellan, was found to replace Sewell as the first mate. The Deering arrived in Rio and delivered their coal. While they were there, Captain Wormwell let his crew take leave, and he met with another captain that he was friends with, Captain Goodwin, who happened to be in Rio as well. Captain Wormel told Goodwin that he disliked his entire crew, except for Herbert Pates, the ship's engineer, who Goodwin also knew. The Deering left Rio on December 2nd and made a stop in Barbados for her supplies. Captain Wormel talked to another friend, Captain Norton. I don't know if all sea captains know each other or what, but Wormel told Norton that he was frustrated with the crew, especially first mate McLellan. He said McLellan was quote, habitually drunk while ashore, unquote, and treated the rest of the crew badly. Badly enough for them to mutiny? Well, we'll see. Meanwhile, McLellan got very, very drunk and also started complaining to poor Captain Norton, who just wanted to hang out at the bar, and McLellan said he was angry about Captain Warmel not allowing him to discipline the crew. He also said that Captain Warmel had poor eyesight and it was damaging their navigational abilities. Captain Norton, the man McLellan was complaining to, would also later report that he and two witnesses had heard McLellan say, quote, I'll get the captain before we get to Norfolk. I will, unquote. McLellan was arrested for drunkenness, but Captain Warmel bailed him out of jail, which I don't know if it was out of the goodness of his heart or because McLellan truly was doing all of the navigation. But either way, the crew set sail for Virginia, on January 9th, 1921. On January 28th, the Cape Lookout Lightship, which is a ship that works as a lighthouse, and which, despite growing up in Massachusetts, I did not know existed until today, spotted the Deering off the coast of North Carolina. The captain of the lightship, Captain Jacobson, reported that a tall, thin, red-headed man called to him through a megaphone and told him that the ship had lost both its anchors in a storm. He asked Jacobson to notify the G.G. Deering Company. Jacobson noticed that the man speaking had a foreign accent, so it was not the captain or the first mate. He tried to report the missing anchors, but his radio was not working. He would also report that the crew of the ship were, quote, milling around, unquote, the quarterdeck, or they usually were not allowed. On January 29th, Another ship saw the Deering off course, headed towards an area with the friendly nickname the Graveyard of the Atlantic. The Diamond Shoals 
are an area of 8 miles or 13 kilometers of sandbar off the coast of North Carolina that are constantly shifting. They've been responsible for at least 600 shipwrecks. The Deering was going straight towards it, but the crew of the other ship didn't see any crew on deck to call to, and they assumed they would see the nearby lighthouses and turn around. And they probably felt really bad about themselves when they found out what happened next. On January 31st, a Coast Guard lookout, C.P. Brady, on Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, spotted the Deering. It had run aground on the Diamond Shoals. All of its sails were still open. Rescue ships were called, but the weather was bad, and they couldn't reach it until February 4th. When a tugboat crew did get aboard, they found the wheel shattered and the rudder damaged. A sledgehammer was nearby. Water was filling the ship through the damaged portions, and like in the Mary Celeste case, the navigation equipment was missing. But in this case, all of the crew's belongings and the log was missing as well. The anchors were gone, as the mysterious redhead had reported. The two lifeboats and life rafts were also gone, and the ladder of the ship was hanging down. Strangely, food was out in the galley, or kitchen of the ship, in the middle of being prepared for the next day, and it actually sounded pretty good. The menu was ribs, pea soup, and coffee. The Coast Guard couldn't salvage the ship, so they destroyed it with dynamite on March 4th. Parts of the ship washed up on the island and were used to build houses. The U.S. government became very interested in the case of the Deering. The Commerce, Treasury, Justice, State Department, and the Navy were all involved in investigating the disappearance. Future President Herbert Hoover was in charge of the Commerce Department at the time. But he was fascinated by the fact that not only did the Deering disappear, but multiple other ships from different countries disappeared in the same area. They eventually realized that most of them had been in the path of several strong hurricanes, which could definitely explain that. But the Deering and one other ship, the Hewitt, were not. In 1922, the government investigation was closed, with no official explanation on what happened to either ship. But of course, there are plenty of theories. On April 11, 1921, a fisherman with the interesting name Christopher Columbus Gray turned over what he claimed was a message in a bottle that he had found off the coast of North Carolina on Buxton Beach. The message read, in all caps, quote, Deering captured by oil-burning boat something like chaser, taking off everything, handcuffing crew, Crew hiding all over ship. No chance to make escape. Finder, please notify headquarters Deering. Unquote. Which, if I was writing a note in a bottle for help, I'd probably try to make the message a little clearer than that. But of course, most of the, the crew were Danish. And right off the bat, a message in a bottle seems more like a creative prank than a real clue. But there are several reasons to think it could be credible. Captain Warmel's widow said that the handwriting on the note was that of the trusted engineer, Bates. When examined, the bottle was determined to be manufactured in Brazil. Also, a steamship like the one described in the message was spotted off, off the Cape Lookout at the time that the lightkeeper captain had tried to signal to. He got no response and couldn't make out the ship name, adding to its mystery. But later examination of the writing by the federal government supported the idea that it was forged, and when Gray was questioned, he said that he forged it, hoping the publicity would get him a job at the lighthouse. The U.S. Marine Shipping Board, as well as Captain Warmel's wife, pushed forward the idea of piracy. The fact that the Hewitt had also gone missing at the same time may lead one to believe there was foul play involved, although they would have had to be some fairly efficient pirates to hit both ships at once and dispose of their entire crews. Some thought that rum runners from the Bahamas had stolen the ship to carry millions of dollars of alcohol, because this was during the age of Prohibition. But the ship was slow and clearly identifiable, so it would have been an odd choice. A big break in this case actually came when police in New York City 
raided the headquarters of the United Russian Workers' Party. There they found papers detailing a plan to steal American ships and sail them to the Soviet Union. I don't know what they wanted with them. This theory was particularly popular among the more anti-communist government officials, of which there were many. There were several other theories, some more plausible than others, if that had happened. Of course, there's always mutiny, which is suggested in almost every ghost ship case. Mutiny is to ghost ships as peanut butter is to jelly. But in this case, the fact that the first mate had explicitly stated that he basically wanted to commit mutiny was definitely some evidence, as well as the fact that Captain Warmel had said he wasn't getting along with the Scandinavian crew. Also, the man that spoke to the lookout was clearly not the captain, or the officer. Senator Frederick Hale from Maine stated straight out that the Deering was, quote, a plain case of mutiny, unquote. This is the theory that makes the most sense to me personally with no expertise at all, but the question remains of what happened to the crew after the mutiny happened. Did they get swamped by waves in the, in the lifeboat? Drift in the path of the hurricanes? Or did they actually escape and find a new life somewhere? Also, because of the location of the ship, there's always the curse of the Bermuda Triangle, where they did sail, although they ended up hundreds of miles away, when the Deering hit the Diamond Shoals. Interestingly, when the Coast Guard did reach the ship, two distress lights had been lit. It's also possible that if something had happened on the Deering that caused the crew to abandon ship, they could have been picked up by the Hewitt, which then also disappeared. It's also possible, but unlikely, that the crew was still on board when the Deering hit the Shoals, and had been swept out to sea when they left in the lifeboats. Today you can visit the bell and the capstan of the Deering at the graveyard of the Atlantic Museum. But again, the fate of the crew remains a mystery. Interestingly, in modern times, dozens of ghost ships appear on the shores of Japan every single year. They likely are coming from North Korean fishermen. Fishing itself is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world today, and fishing is one of North Korea's biggest exports today to China. They specialize in king crab, squid, and sandfish. Many of the boats are owned by the North Korean army, and the winter is a peak for the ghost ships to appear, partially because of the wind currents bringing the ships to Japan, and partially because the conditions are more severe for the crews. Some people believe that the empty ships may be from failed defectors, but it's much more common for North Koreans to flee south, where there's a shared language and cultural history. Most of the defectors who have rarely arrived in Japan by boat have drifted there by accident. The connections that the ships have with the North Korean army have led some to speculate they're being used to transport spies to Japan. But journalists also do not believe this is the case, because it would be much easier and safer for any spies to enter on a commercial flight or boat with fake documents. Some ships have arrived with the crew still on board, but no longer alive, sometimes just skeletons, which shows that the boats have been drifting for months or years. For both these and the empty ghost ships, the vessels are usually old, without modern navigation equipment or engines. If they had drifted off course in the harsh winter, they generally don't carry extra food, which is hard to come by in North Korea. Part of the reason that there seems to be an increase in the ghost ships appearing is likely also because of the dark fleet. Chinese fishermen with significantly more resources have been illegally fishing in North Korean waters in violation of the United Nations rules in what experts have called, quote, the largest known case of illegal fishing perpetrated by a single industrial fleet operating in another nation's waters, unquote. Because of this, North Korean fishermen have been forced farther out and to go out for longer. Their ships have been bound as far north as Russia. Unclaimed bodies in Japan are cremated and brought to a Buddhist shrine. And as for the North Korean ghost ships, they're destroyed.